So this panel is on socio-cultural issues and it's been moderated by Susan Snyder and George Thomas. Susan Snyder, can, can you hear me okay? Susan Nigra Snyder is a registered architect and a partner with George Thomas in Civic Visions, a Philadelphia-based firm. Susan investigates how local identity is expressed, maintained, and able to develop while being responsive to larger global and media forces that affect the realms of contemporary life. She has received University of Pennsylvania Research Foundation grants to study forces of consumption on urban form. Public service includes serving as chair of Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority, uh, Redevelopment Authority's Advisory Board of Design, a member of the Fine Arts Committee of the Delaware Valley, Smart Growth Alliance jury, and was one of my favorite professors, uh, my favorite professor while I studied at the University of Pennsylvania. George Thomas is a cultural and architectural historian and has written and lectured widely on 19th and early 20th century American architecture with a focus on the relationship between cultural innovation and architectural design. His teaching seeks to understand the interconnections between history and patterns of modern life. He has written many, many books which are much too long to list right now. Thank you, Susan and George. We're very pleased to be here. Um, Pull the mic to you. Pull the mic closer. I will say again, we're very pleased to be here. Um, it seems to me that the entire day has been about culture, even though this one session is titled Socioculture Issues. Um, the entire day has been about culture. And what is interesting is that we understand that culture is not any one medium. Uh, we heard at lunch, it's, it's the spoken word, it's dance, it's how you treat each other, it's architecture, it's writing, it's music. Uh, culture is really how we communicate meaning. Uh, and what we've been talking about today strikes me as talking about what are the values um, that begin to build the idea, that begin to be what you express in your meaning. Uh, what is the identity? Uh, culture is really something that is iterative, it's dynamic, we learn from that, it's ongoing, it's changing. So it's a, very, it's a very interesting topic to try to get at the essence of. Um, it's really not an issue of style. It's an issue of values. It's an issue of identity. Uh, it's something that we cannot predict where in the future it will take us. Everything that Susan said, I totally agree with, so that you have to understand that at the beginning. I, I'm a historian. Susan's an architect. <laughs> And we see the world at sort of 90 degrees to each other, and we basically sort of move forward together, which is sort of fun. Uh, one of the images that comes to me is thinking back uh, as a historian of the 20th century and Ezra Pound's great claim that the artist is the antenna of the race. And so we've got a great artist here to plug us into uh, the way that art sees in multiple dimensions and helps us understand worlds that are coming that we don't yet know about, which is, of course, the great role that art is always about. The counter to that, of course, is that we as historians and people who look into history and try to understand how we got to where we are, not because we get to run the same race over again, because that doesn't ever seem to happen, but uh, because it gives us insights into understanding our world, comes to the side of history and anthropology and uh, the, the two dimensions that we're going to try to bridge here as we put uh, this uh, session together. Uh, <clears throat> Sam wants to go first, sorry. Uh, what, what does strike me is uh, one of the great ideas that an architect that I did a lot of work on as a PhD student and then later actually got around to writing the book on, but William Price made the case when he was asked why cities were so ugly he made the case that basically <clears throat> cities only became beautiful when the people who lived in them were beautiful. And beyond that, he said that once people are happy, once, once their lives are good, once their lives are rich, then they will make beautiful cities out of their own engagement. Uh, and what I think we've seen here today is an extraordinary thing. To see all of you 
here all day so engaged. Uh, and uh, our experience looking at America would have been that there would have been three fist fights, uh, you know, four or, four, four or five politicians shooting each other, uh, and all sorts of things. So this has been an extraordinary experience. So we're going to kick off with Stanley, and Susan is going to introduce Stanley because they're old friends by, by relation. Stanley Burnside received his bachelor's and master of fine arts degree from the University of Pennsylvania, where I knew his brother. <laughs> Speak to him, Mark. Okay, sorry. Stanley received his bachelor and master of fine arts degree at University of Pennsylvania, where I, add, I knew his brother Jackson. Um, in 1979, he returned to the Bahamas, became a member of the Saxons, and later a founding member of the One Family Group. He went on to teach. <laughs> At the College of the Bahamas, he is a co-founder of the collective, this is really clever, Bahamian Creative Artists United for Serious Expression, because, <laughs> which promotes Bahamian art internationally. Burnside's work remains committed to his belief that Bahamian art is a powerful tool in socioeconomic development. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do I really need this mic or are you recording? Okay, all right. Uh, it really is quite amazing to see so many familiar faces here. And, uh, okay, yeah. It really is amazing to see so many familiar faces here. When I told the dean that I was going to be bringing uh, something different to this, he said, oh boy, you know. He was a little worried, I think, you know, but uh, I promise you, uh, you know, you won't be, uh, you know, you won't be charged with anything as a result of my presentation <laughs> here today. <laughs> that I can promise you. But let me just say that uh, I'm going to look at it from the angle strictly as an artist. And you know, we artists are dreamers. You know, you have the technician here who will talk about the uh, project from a more uh, pragmatic point of view. But we artists think in an abstract way. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, the Bahamas is, uh, is all about the rhythm. You know, the rhythm of the drum, the rhythm of the people, the rhythm of the people who've been there all day, listening to all kind of talks, <laughs> and who probably want to get a little relief. You know, that is what culture does. And culture comes in, let me talk about, you know, the family in Exuma, living on the ocean, right? They don't have any cash, but they have the ocean that they can go to every day, you know? They can climb a coconut tree and get the coconut and get some coconut juice. You know, they got fruit in the gardens. You know, they can eat, man, you know? That's wealth, right? Now what happens when the big project comes in? and they take over the beach. The beach is no longer available, but they give the person a job, right? And he has some cash in his pocket, but he can no longer go to the beach. What happens? What happens then? You know, that is my concern as an artist. So I feel that uh, Conferences like this are so important because you get the opportunity to communicate with the people and to find out what their needs are. You know, I am I'm a great believer in the genius of the Bahamian people. I believe that we have the genius in our in our own hearts, in our own minds, in our own heritage to create the plan for the future of the Bahamas. You know, many of us, we do things from scratch. You know, there's a thing called Jean-Cano, you know, and a very famous uh, Bahamian musician said, 
It's called Junkanoo because uh, the artists make new things from junk. So it's Junkanoo. And Bahamians can make things happen. Bahamians went out to Arawaki years ago and they decided they wanted to make some restaurants. And they just made some ramshackle restaurants from scratch, from junk. And nowadays those restaurants are one of our tourist attractions. You know, as an artist and as someone who has studied art abroad, one of my dreams is to exploit the talent that we have in this country. We are a country of thousands of artists. I'm sure that per capita, we have more artists in this country than anywhere else in the world. I'm certain of it. Why on Bay Street, Boxing Day and New Year's, you have thousands of artists, thousands. And I'm not just talking about craftsmen. Many of these people who participate in Junkanoo are artists who could be introduced to more permanent materials and who could feed their families with their talent. That is my dream. My dream is to exploit the talents of Bahamians in craft and in art. We have a multi-million dollar souvenir industry. A multi-million dollar souvenir industry. And I mean, those of you who uh, understand what I'm talking about, uh, why can't we marry those artists with this industry? You know, it seems, it seems very simple, but uh, I contend that we're looking at employment, we're looking at industry. Take Junkanoo. Take the designs and the color of Junkanoo. Imagine a textile industry. Imagine a clothing industry. Imagine uh, prints, t-shirts, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, items with Junkanoo design and craft on them. Why can't we do that? I mean, it's just sitting there, and why haven't we done it? I say that uh, when you talk about developing the Bahamas, you have to talk about the empowerment of our people. And you have to look around to see how can we create opportunities for Bahamians to be empowered, opportunities for Bahamians to control their own destiny, opportunities for Bahamians to be self-sustaining, to make livings, to feed their families. And I contend that we are sitting on a gold mine in Junkanoo. Now Junkanoo is the art of collaboration. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Okay. Junkanoo is the art of collaboration. And you know in Junkanoo, Artists get together to create works of art collaboratively. So I think that we are uniquely qualified if we have the right kinds of communication with those who come here to, with plans to develop our country. We are uniquely qualified to collaborate with those people. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think we will have projects that are self-sustaining because there is the potential for Bahamians to rise up at some point and to wonder why they're not in control of their own country. You know, you have to be very, very careful about that. You know, there's the, the balance that has to be created between independence and trying to be Western. You know, Bahamians are very much into making money, right? But Bahamians also have to be concerned about how much of this country do we own? How much of this country 
will our children own at the end of the exercise? And as an artist, I can say those things and get away with them because they expect for me to be crazy, right? <laughs> but the art of collaboration, we are a country of collaboration. I, along with my brother and an artist, John Beadle, created a collaborative series of paintings called Jammin. And in those paintings, the three of us worked on all of the pieces collaboratively. We had been working in the Junkanoo shacks together on Junkanoo pieces, and we took that same spirit of collaboration into the studio and created paintings. And these are some of the paintings. This was the first piece we did together. The amazing thing about these works are uh, they all look like they were created by one individual when three of us were working together on them. This is a group called Because, the collaborative group that we started together. This is my brother Jackson, and we were working deep in winter. You know, it was very, very cold. It was about 65 degrees. <laughs> it's a series of paintings we did for Atlantis. Some of you might have seen them. We took some of this collaborative work to Atlanta for the Olympics, and uh, our cousin Sidney Poitier opened the exhibition. But I'm showing these just to show you an example of the kinds of collaboration potential we have in art in this country. So many Junkanoo artists work together and have been working together for years, and I think we have to find a way to take those Junkanoo artists and show them how they can use permanent materials to create works of art that will last and not be perishable like Junkanoo. Okay, this is the last piece, and this was uh, acquired by this young man you might be familiar with. Well, uh, I'd like to introduce my accompanist, uh, Mr. Pat Carey, the leader of the Baha Men, <laughs> and Ruben Delavo, master drummer. No, John Canoe is a wonderful thing. I'm ending right now, you know? I know you've been here all day, you know? I mean, there's a thing that you do in John Canoe that, I mean, you really get free, you know? In John Canoe, you see people, when they dance, they look like this. 
you know, they're just gone. They're freeing. And everybody can do this. Everybody can do this. So if you get the leaders of the project and the locals together and let them dance some Junkanoo, you'll have a great collaboration. So I want to thank you for inviting me. So the good news for Michael Pateman is he gets to follow Stanley. <laughs> and Michael is the senior archaeologist for the Antiquities Monuments and Museum Corporation at the National Museum of the Bahamas. He holds a PhD uh, in regional plan development planning and an MA in applied anthropology, public archaeology. Dr. Pateman's research aims to integrate community indigenous-based knowledge and scientific knowledge to develop effective plans and policies for sustainable protection of important cultural and natural resources, most particularly Stanley. <laughs> His other research interests include pre-Columbian diet, political ecology, and heritage management. So go for it. Well, I want to thank the organizers for including me in this wonderful conference. And I would also like to thank whoever put together this program for putting me after Stanley. I just <laughs> <laughs> woke everyone back up. <laughs> but um, just to give a little background, as said, I work with the Antiquities Monuments and Museum Corporation. And we are the principal heritage conservation agency for the country. Um, we are a quasi-governmental agency. And just by saying what I did, that shows we have a massive man mandate. But what I'm going to just talk about, and this presentation has changed <coughs> multiple times, starting from last night when we had a meeting with all the speakers and so forth, I changed it. Then just sitting here, I started changing it. So I'm glad I decided against a PowerPoint. But I'm looking at sort of this central question of how do we, con how do we consider the concept of sustainable economic development with yeah. cultural heritage? And I think this sort of ties in almost everything that we've been talking about. With my PhD studies, I felt like I was a lone wolf, wolf a lot of the times. I was the anthropologist and a group of economic development people. Everybody had a background in economics, planning, architecture. Everybody was concerned with economic development. But I always brought back, <coughs> where's culture? We talked about sustainable development. And my argument was, yes, culture is included in part of sustainable development but it's underthought about. And it should be, in my opinion, and this may just be my anthropological background, that culture is the most important part of sustainable development. And one of the broader parts, questions that I'm going to look at here is sort of the question of heritage or cultural-based tourism, and ultimately how this leads to sort of proper planning and sustainability. So what is Bahamian cultural heritage? Um, I think Stan gave a excellent excellent example but I don't think and a lot of people have said this this is something that you can put a definition on there's just so many diverse islands and all on all of these diverse islands we find just diverse and rich heritage so our culture almost changes with the islands we go on even the way we speak if you travel to a lot of the family islands you find the dialects slightly different you find the way they make the isle the local bread different even when I went to the Turks and Caicos Islands, which is culturally and geog geographically is very similar to the Bahamas, the food was slightly different. I had peas and rice, and it was different. I had crack conch, and it was different. But it was still crack conch. So this is something that you can never really put a definition on. And we have to remember that culture always evolves and changes. Um, one of the arguments I've heard a lot sort of locally is that, oh, we don't have a Bahamian culture because we take and adapt things and try to bring it into our own. But I'll, my response to that is, well, that's part of culture. Culture changes. But one of the problems I have, and we've even talked about it here a little bit with the <laughs> tourism potential, is that we sell this concept of sand, sun, sea, people, and food when we talk about culture and talk about the Bahamas. And we also sell Junkanoo. But we have to remember that our culture is not only these things, and it's not only Junkanoo. 
And these are the things that we Bahamians tend to sell. And then sort of a little note I made to myself during another presentation is, we talked about using sustainable development to improve the quality of life. But to whose standards are we improving these qualities? We look at a lot of indigenous communities that we've developed, but the quality of life has gone down. Um, even in the Bahamas, with the recent electrification of a lot of the family islands, a lot of people will say that is development. But if you talk to some of the older residents of those islands, they hated it. It really changed their way of life. The, the introduction of phone systems through a lot of the, out, the family islands recently, that once again changed their way of life and it put a huge economic strain on islands that weren't used to these bills and so forth. So did we really improve their way of life? But I just wanted to talk about some aspects of our cultural heritage and especially our historic cultural heritage. And this begins with our, what I'll call our Lucayan legacy. Um, Lucayans are the first natives to the Bahamas. And although they are gone today, uh, they, have, they left a lot of sort of things behind a legacy, including a lot of words that we use today. Hurricane is a Lucayan word, barbecue, hammocks, and so forth. Those are Lucayan words. And although it's taught that by 1513 all Lucayans were gone from the Bahamas, we know from archaeological research that especially on Eleuthera, we know that Lucayans were there when the English started to settle the islands. So if we want to put that in the context of Exuma, that which isn't far from Eleuthera, there's the possibility that there were indigenous people in the Bahamas when our cultural, current cultural ways started to form. So how much of their culture and lifestyle has survived today? We also have this legacy of Columbus that we like to push under the rock somewhere. But one of the arguments I also make is that the landfall of Columbus at San Salvador, whether it's Cat Island or San Salvador, <laughs> I won't get into that argument. It's the singular most important historical event in the New World. And we Bahamians, except for those who actually live on San Salvador and, and some people on Cat Island, this is an event of our culture and our heritage that we ignore and we like to disregard. Um, I'll give an example of now we have the National Heroes Day instead of Columbus Day. I think that's a discussion we need to revisit to evolve our culture. We also have a lot of, we have Spanish cultural heritage. A lot of the early, early Spanish colonial explorers of the New World wrecked in the Bahamas. Um, in the early 1500s, we have Spanish shipwrecks throughout the Bahamas, and including in Exuma, where the earliest known, or at least earliest found wreck in the New World is located in the Exumas. This is an aspect of our culture and our heritage that we need to understand, know, and share. And then, of course, almost the biggest aspects of our cultural heritage from the historic standpoint begins with the loyalists and their slaves. And in Exuma, this is really, really prominent because one of the biggest um, slave owners in the Bahamas was a Roel. And if you go to Exuma now, everybody is named Roel, well, at least from, in my experience. <laughs> but this sort of shows that these ties and these legacies come on. And in Exuma, and I'm going to focus the rest of this on Exuma, the culture and the heritage really starts to grow from after the loyalists and their slaves. We get into the emancipation and how the lifestyles changed and grew. And I cut out a lot of stuff that Eris Monker talked about at lunchtime. These, the development of dance, the development of music, the development of foods. All of this really took forth after emancipation. And then we also have the other really singular event in Bahamian history, which also signifies our culture and our heritage. We talk about independence. So how do we protect and sustain this heritage? Well, before we talk about that, let's look at threats first. We have, and it's being talked about throughout, we have ad hoc development, no planned development, or a planned development that does not consider culture and heritage. And Mr. Director of Works, I have to say, when you do the new highway in Exuma, let's make sure we look for the historic sites first so we can make sure that we protect them and involve them in the planning process. Um, we have a unsustainable growth, and Exuma is another prime example of this, where you have large hotels on little islands. And this really destroys ways of life, destroys the culture of the island. Um, I think Four Seasons is a perfect example of that where Exuma, and from when I went there as a boy a lot, 
changed with the development of Four Season. I heard a lot of people talk about, well, they had to bring in workers, so you brought in a lot of people from New Providence, construction workers. Where'd they go after the construction was done? A lot of them stayed. They kept, and they brought their way of life into Exuma. And so I've heard a lot of people, a lot of my friends from Exuma talk about how their lifestyle changed with the construction of Four Season. Another big threat to culture, and no offense to the politicians in the room, but uneducated politicians. <laughs> Our culture is something that we have to make sure that our politicians understand the importance of. Because our culture, in my opinion, and in a lot of scholars' opinions, is one of the most important things about who we are. And if we don't protect these, then these things will go away. And that actually ties into uneducated people. So how do we fix this? Well, some of the things started coming up already. One of the key things is local buy-in. When we talk about these tourism projects, and I hate to use tourism as, ex as an example of development because it keeps us in this service-based economy, which really has shown itself over time is not very sustainable. But if we look at tourism, cultural tourism is the number one reason why people travel today in the world. But yet, what do we do in the Bahamas for cultural tourism? I can give an example of New Providence. Um, our work, we manage the Fort Fincastle environment. That is the most visited site in the Caribbean by tourists outside of downtown Nassau. The number one visited site in the Caribbean. But, and we'll even say it, it's a dump. We need to convince our politicians, our leaders, our people that an investment in our culture, our cultural heritage can return economic gains. Um, so local buy-in is a key thing. Another sort of solution what I look at is sort of, we need to look at a way of life impact studies. When we talk about massive development on, fin on islands or even any sort of development, we should look at how is this gonna change the way of life? Is this true development or not? And then one of my big advocates is the cultural resource management study. Also, I think we in the Bahamas need to start to look at, stop um, internalizing things because we here like to say, oh, we don't need international help. Just because they do it that way elsewhere doesn't mean we have to bring it here. But there's important agencies like UNESCO, and I wish um, Frankie Wilson had stayed here because I felt that his appointment as the chairman of UNESCO, although he resigned, was probably the most important job that he had because this is an agency that, de that dedicates itself to the protection of culture. And there are five cultural conventions in UNESCO and the Bahamas has only signed one, and probably the least impactful of all of the conventions. We have the World Heritage Convention that's concerned with the built and natural environment, which the Bahamas has not signed. We have the tangible cultural heritage, which that convention gives money to countries to develop cultural policies, but the Bahamas cannot benefit because we haven't signed. There's intangible cultural heritage, which we haven't signed, and then underwater cultural heritage. And all these forms of heritage are things that the Bahamas has, Exuma has, the islands have, but we're not benefiting from. And this where goes into my final point of where I believe, and we all should do, education is key. We can't have forums like this and not go out and educate. When I asked the question earlier, in one of the earlier sessions, is how many government officials, when we do these projects on family islands, do we actually go out in the community and educate the people outside of local government? Because we can do a project, we can inform local government, and they can inform their constituents, but some information will be lost. But when we present it, we can educate the people and they can understand the importance, and that's where we begin to get the local buy-in, and we can build a sort of bottom-up understanding of the importance of our cultural and these things that we're trying to do. Thank you. Michael, I thought you were going to dance. <laughs> I left that for Stan. <laughs> I, I want to make one comment. Um, just in kind of tying together the dynamism of culture that Michael is talking about and the collaboration that Stanley is talking about, I think um, before we begin the questions, I just want to throw out that I think that gives a different a different edge to the idea of planning and zoning as a fixed idea 
but that might in fact be a collaborative impact-based idea such that it's not something that is fixed in stone forever, but something that has a dynamic quality and a collaborative quality as it goes forth, uh, which is something I know exists in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but doesn't exist in many other places in the United States. There's a lot to learn from impact zoning instead of fixed zoning, uh, which would aid the plans and might bring these two ideas of dynamism and collaboration always on the table and always together. Let me say one other thing, too, that did strike me as I look across this room and think of all the people that come here. It occurs to me that one of the issues that every resort has to deal with, every place that is both a nation, a home, a, uh, a resort, is that everybody has their own vision of it, their own fantasy of what is the perfection of this place. Uh, and part of the game that all of you have to grapple with uh, is all the different visions. So th to me, this was a wonderful way to sort of bring ideas together, but there's certainly got to be questions. Comments. Comments. Criticism. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd just like to ask a question based on the comment that Michael made about uh, large developments that, that impact the way of life for communities. When I worked at the Bass Commission, we had flagged for Exuma um, the fact that one of the large developments had resulted in increase in prostitution, sexually transmitted diseases, um, but we were told by the, the, pres the administration at the time to stick to environmental issues and not ask those types of questions. Um, so what I wanted to know is, I know this is mainly a design and planning project, but is there any scope to look at the social issues that are in the exumas? There is teenage pregnancy, there is drug use, there is alcoholism, and how do you address those issues while trying to make um, the exuma sustainable? Well, I could jump. Stacy, I've had that similar sort of thing come up before. I know with the Rumkey development, I brought up the same thing about this is such a massive development for a little island. What about the social impacts? And was told the same thing. However, though, I think this forum where we're looking at sustainability, the social issues are equally as important and I think fits into this session, although we've kind of overly focused on culture. So I think all of those have to be addressed if we're going to come up with a s true sustainable plan. Hi, uh, Mark Daniels again from the Levy Reserve in Eleuthera. And just a comment on what you had said, uh, Dr. Pigman, about preserving cultural um, and uh, cultural knowledge. Uh, so at the preserve, if most persons aren't familiar, we are a native plant preserve where we promote and celebrate our native species of plants in the Bahamas and more so uh, educate visitors, and that's local students and uh, tourists to the island, about the traditional uses of plants that uh, we would have used in Eleuthera and in the Bahamas. And it's been an interesting experience watching uh, not only the students enjoy the experience of coming to the preserve, looking at plants that might have been used to treat the cold or the flu, uh, sitting down and making bush teas, enjoying that experience, and also watching uh, visitors to the island appreciate the, the fact that we are trying to preserve that knowledge and pass it on, uh, not only through word of mouth, um, which we would have traditionally had from your grandmother that might have said, go boil this, twig in the backyard because you're barely hurting. Um, so we feel as though we're serving that role in, in continuing the transference of that knowledge. And I think that that type of model can be replicated in every island. And not only about the plants, uh, but as you said, historical buildings, features beneath the water. And I know that uh, the potential for it is great. And so I just wanted to say from my point of view that uh, persons are very much interested in it and there is a value on it, a, a, a tourism value on it. And it has attracted persons, as we've been open only two years now, 
People have come back multiple times to visit, multiple times to visit, and we've gotten very positive feedback from the experience in itself. And so I would like to see more projects like that, or like ours, done throughout the Bahamas. So I just wanted to comment. For the record, that's what we wanted to do at the Botanic Gardens, but they wouldn't let us do it. <laughs> uh, good evening. I first I'd like to say, uh, you couldn't have chosen two better speakers for this cultural um, presentation. Um, Mr. Payton, I just want, for the record, I just want you to know, in terms of the Caribbean, facts show that visitors come to the Caribbean primarily for the sun sign and sea, but it is the culture which binds them to the destination, and makes them come back over and over again. And that's why, like Eleuthera, Eleuthera was dead and that preserve, I don't know how many of you have been there. It is truly, it truly reflects the culture, not just of Eleuthera, of the whole Bahamas, you know, that part of, yes. Uh, but I have a little, um, Mr. Stan Burnside, my dear friend, um, I, I have one issue in terms of Junkanoo. The, the Junkanoo fellas, you have to do more in terms of the entrepreneurial aspect. Um, you know, like I, I have a little vacation rental property and my guests all go to Junkanoo. They came back, they say, hey, I saw no souvenirs, no Junkanoo souvenirs. Why can't, can't you have more involvement? Why can't you have costumes where we could participate and so forth? I think there's so much more. I think you, you, you look at just, you spend so much time on the two events that not enough is being done in terms of truly promoting the culture. The, the, of Junkanoo, and there's so much more. I have a million one ideas I would like to throw to you, but you, you really, I'm preaching to a believer, because you and Jackson and some of the others have done, look at what you did with Dungalik, and look at some of the other uh, projects that you did with your artwork and so forth. But the Junkanoo community has tremendous potential that you're not exploiting. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> You're preaching in the same church. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the tourism icons of the ba tourism icons of the Bahamas. Uh, you know, give her a round of applause, <laughs> Mrs. Angela Clare. And uh, I agree with you, Angela. I mean, you know, my brother before he passed, he had this saying that uh, by the year 2020 more people will come to the Bahamas for culture than for sun, sand, and sea. And I agree with you, that's possible, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, sitting a few seats over from you is Angelique McKay, who has done a lot of work in that regard and has some tremendous ideas <coughs> that she has put uh, into fruition. And I think, you know, I agree with you, we're sitting on a gold mine. I mean, there's so many opportunities for entrepreneurship in Junkanoo. I have a group that performs at Paradise Island uh, twice a week, on Wednesdays at 9, Saturdays at 9.30, by the way, in Marina Village uh, at Atlantis. And we've been performing for 10 years now. And uh, I mean, so that's a sustaining employment opportunity. And I think there's so many other opportunities that can come out of this thing called Junkanoo. So I totally agree with you, and thank you so much for all the work that you've done in, uh, in tourism and uh, keeping us uh, grounded. Thank you. Let me add on to that, though. Uh, while we do have people come for the sun, sand, and sea, part of it is because we do such a poor job of selling our culture, not to tourists, but to ourselves. I mean, now that you're on our board, you see the fight we have with the locals on admission to sites. We have to educate our people better. And by the way, Angelique works with us now, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're lucky to have her. Yeah. Question here. Comment. Yes, I, I would just like to say that, that I love that guy, Stan Burnside. And, um, I love you too, Chris Moxie. Yeah, baby. <laughs> and he sacrificed his son to the island school many years ago. And, yeah. and Literally, he is a symbol for creativity and imagination, and that is, and I'm, I'm barring from many great thinkers, this is not a Chris Maxey idea, that is gonna be the trick to make these magical places work, is human creativity. 
and, and I, I'm, I'm inspired that you're part of this conference and I think a lot needs to be, um, a lot of credit needs to be given to the dean because I know from just looking at his website that Dean Mustafavi is all about creativity and imagination and doing things completely different. Imagine instead of a golf course that we build an agricultural park. What a crazy idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to jump in because I'm hearing things. It seems like there needs to be an entrepreneurial center uh, in this nation that helps people bring uh, ideas to realization. And uh, Michael was uh, explaining to me that uh, there is one, but it's political. So I thought he'd help us explain this. <laughs> <laughs> Jump it. Help, help us understand. I think it was best said there. I work for governments that so don't kill me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I say something? Uh, I am developing a program now where we have identified a few Junkanoo artists who happen to be really, really fine artists, but who have never used any other material other than Junkanoo. <laughs> so we want them to be able to, to paint and sculpt and make items that can hang on walls in museums and, and go into sculpture gardens. Because we feel that these artists, every year, you know, uh, are just not using their talents, you know? And uh, I have friends who come to the Bahamas every so often, uh, who I studied with in the US. Artists who know about art and artists' talents. And they look at some of the guys working in the Junkanoo shacks, just drawing on cardboard and using cardboard to create sculptures and you say my god man how could a government just ignore all of that raw talent i mean you're sitting and i hate to say it over again you're sitting on a gold mine this the creative talent of bahamian people in junkano and i agree with you uh, it's not just junkano i mean it's so many other areas that are just as important as junkano but the creative talents are i mean we really really have to find a way like uh, Angela said to exploit it, you know? I just wanted to say that. All right, good afternoon. My name is Cameron Saunders. I am a deputy park warden for the Bahamas National Trust. Um, I guess in talking about culture, um, it came, uh, the idea came to me earlier in one of the earlier sessions, and I thought I'd wait for now to bring it up. But um, in terms of education, I want to know if in the schools, in the high schools particularly, was there any um, fundamental economic um, classes or information being given to the students? And if there is, and they want to know if it could be, I guess, um, incorporated into, I guess, a mandatory um, curriculum. I mean, uh, I guess as everyone's saying now, talking about culture, we are people who, I mean, anybody could really could be creative, but to marry creativity and I guess kind of business tactics, I think is a, a way forward. So I wonder if you could speak to that, please. Well, I'm also chairman of the board of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, and the education officer at the National Art Gallery has developed a teacher's kit that uh, traces the whole history of Bahamian art uh, from the beginning to the present. And they have uh, uh, given these kits to uh, the teachers in the various schools. And I think that's only the beginning of an education process about the importance and, and, and the contribution of <coughs> the artists in this country. And I don't know if that answers your question. But um, yeah. along those points, Partially we, said, we yeah. also have an education officer and is in the process of developing things for the schools. But a lot of the cultural heritage, what I was talking about and what we focus on, will be things that are taught in history. And unfortunately, history is not a mandatory subject here. So some get it, some don't. But um, culture is almost, in my opinion, culture is something that, as I said, changes and evolves. So that would be something that's difficult to teach in a classroom setting what is Bahamian culture. Because we live it, we breathe it, we act it, we do it. E almost everything we do can be tied back into our culture. And so, but there, I think one of the big steps is we need a national cultural policy, which I know has been drafted. 
I don't know where that ever went. And, I, and we need cultural legislation to help really mandate these things, which unfortunately we don't have. And we also need one other thing to add to them down here. Um, we need to use Junkanoo ourselves as a people. And we've done something, this is an ad, people, so I hope I don't have to pay for it. Um, this coming Saturday, we are going to have the second annual uh, Exuma Society, uh, Cancer Society Ball. One of the things we did last year at the ball, and we'll do again this year, is we instituted a competition that it's a masquerade ball. But the theme has got to be Junkanoo. And so the mask's got to be Junkanoo. So we're giving first, second, third, and fourth prize to the best uh, mask made by uh, an attendant. And we will, we will judge that. And this is, every year, this is going to become an event. It's the masquerade ball, the Kansas Society masquerade ball. It's a Junkanoo theme, and you have to Put your mask in competition, but you have to make the mask or have it made. You can't buy a store-made mask like a lot of us did last year. Uh, so, you know, that's one way that we can get junk new into the culture is by using it in different ways like this. And um, I, we're looking forward to, if you're in Exuma Saturday night, even if you don't have a mask, come, but please bring a mask. There'll be, because it's a charity, there'll be no charge, but if it was your private business, Minister DeVoe. Thanks. I just wanted to make an observation regarding the, and I hate to fall into a trap of appearing to be helpless, but it is incredible how difficult it is to find information on the history of the Bahamas. I read three books recently, a novel, The Last Marlin, which is a history of marlin fishing in Bimini, a textbook called The History of Florida, and then a piece called The Swamp, which is the building of the Everglades and the drainage system in South Florida. From those three books, I learned more about the Bahamas and the Seminole Indians and Andrews than I did in all my life. Now, if we are going to promote <coughs> cultural tourism and we are going to evoke the connectivity, say, between Florida and Andrews with the Seminole Indians, it cannot be fair and right that is not taught in our schools or that you have to go to Harvard to learn about this. Because most of the information is probably contained in army journals. And we're not soldiers. Because the war with the Seminoles was about the resettlement of the Indian tribes. And much of our history is tied to that. So if we, it is difficult to explain how challenging it is for a young entrepreneur seeking to develop a tour that is relevant, historically accurate, and culturally well-founded to say, okay, I want to do something about the Chamberlain Estate in Andros and the Seminole Indians because I want to promote my cultural history and my tradition to visitors. You would be lying through your teeth <laughs> because the information is very difficult to find and put together. But that, to me, is the challenge we must confront <laughs> in order to make this an entrepreneurial activity and realize the potential that exists. Because it's also true in Baratari. Uh, I hear the story about the roles and Pompeii and whatever, but the inaccuracies that you uncover, and I think it's, it's a betrayal of trust where people are going looking for their history, for their roots, and some schema is lying to them about what actually happened. And so there's a, a need for historical accuracy, but it's very difficult to put this information together. And I think one of the things that should come out of this is perhaps a way to do what has been done in the great cities, such as London, where you see some of the plaques on walls. They're historically accurate. They're research, and it's summarized in a few paragraphs. We can have some of that about what happened in Red Base or what happened in Roll Town then we can have a sense of place and being that helps to build this tradition and make cultural entrepreneurs. I enjoyed the books, by the way. <laughs> May I add to that point, though? I mean, there is a book on the Seminoles of Andrus, but it's a very academic book. And that's now where I start to blame my colleagues who've worked in this field before me, and even myself. I've published in the academic world, but I really have never put out a general publication for the public. Um, so 
it's about how do we get this knowledge that's in here and in these academic journals out to the <laughs> Bahamian people. There's lots of information about these sites that we have at Antiquities that we have to figure out a way to disseminate to the public better. Um, I could talk about a project we're working on now where we are doing that, which includes some aspects of Exuma. Um, we're redoing the Pompeii Museum, which most Bahamians knew burned down in a fire. And we're doing aspects of Bahamian slavery. So it's a real sort of look at slavery and emancipation in the Bahamas. But part of that, we're, we're doing such detailed historical research that we'll be able to provide more information so that not just the information that Gail Saunders put out in the 80s or that academics have put out will be there. It's going to be more for high schools, primary schools, Bahamians, so that tour guides, everybody. Um, it's, it's a challenge about making sure you have the historical, authentic information. Because some tour guides believe, oh, they just want to hear a good story. But no, people want to hear the truth. Uh, we could look at our New Providence, we have Blackbeard's Tower, which was never occupied by Blackbeard's. It's a name that was created by tourism in the 50s, and it's created a life of its own. So it's these type of things that we have to fight against. <laughs> Angela, all eyes went on you. Okay, we have one more question. This, this one is um, for you, Michael, with the UNESCO conventions that we have not signed on to. What, what is the disadvantage? Why, you know, because there must be some disadvantage why we have not signed on to the four most important ones. And in, in us signing on to that, it assists us in, in the marketing of that which is our culture because you have the tangible and you have the intangible. And because we're such an oral society, we get to tie into all of that. And we have so many sites throughout the Bahamas that you know we can just market ourselves through UNESCO for the culture and heritage of our country. So what, what are the disadvantages? And who is the driving agency that gets to convince our politicians to get our chairman to sign on to these? Well, um, the disadvantages. Honestly, I have not found any yet. Um, pr before, it was a lack of education to the politicians. And this is where, once again, I blame us, is we didn't do a good enough job educating the politicians, at, at least in my opinion, from the feedback I had gotten. So World Heritage Convention is something that Antiquities is pushing forward. Um, I believe the Bahamas already pays our UNESCO dues, and the financial commitment comes out of that. The tangible and intangible cultural heritage convention School. should be something that the Ministry of Culture pushes, um, or the UNESCO desk fits, sits under education. So there is confusion about responsibilities and roles. Um, underwater heritage convention is the one that there are some issues, in my opinion, with signing because it, that's the one that limits the country and puts really strong stipulations on what you can and cannot do. But the rest, I have, I've not seen any disadvantages. <laughs> we're working on it. I, I believe we're close to signing the World Heritage Convention. I can't speak to the other one, so sorry. I just We're recording, so you have to use a mic. That was the last. I've done a little work on the UNESCO uh, heritage sites in Mexico, and I just want—I don't know if it's for sure the same thing here, but. One of the downsides is going to bring us back to the discussion about economic development. When you work with UNESCO, they are very restrictive, restrictive about what can be done on properties and lands. So it could very well be that the kind of fear of losing uh, the capacity to sell land for, to private developers is what's getting in the way of signing the UNESCO heritage. Um, yeah, uh, this should be the last comment. Thank you, Michael. Well, to answer that, um, once, yeah, if a country does sign the World Heritage Convention, when you nominate the site is when you start to put the restrictions on the country. Um, there is limitations on what you should do to a World Heritage site. And once a country has nominated the site, and we're talking about, once again, cultural heritage and heritage tourism, why do you want to develop that site? You, I mean, people are coming to see that site as a heritage site. So, and you can't... It's not yeah. why you and I want to develop mm. Uh, that's not our case, though. That's, it's just, I no. mean, it's not. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 no, you're right. It's a big issue, but um, I think it's a minor issue. But 
Who knows? Good. We, we just want to thank the panel for being, I think, the best panel of all time. And the musicians. Uh, and, the musicians. And, partic and particularly the musicians. But just to say what a great event this has been and how much fun it's been. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, now to wrap up, and I know you're all sitting there wondering, um, you know, what, what thoughts have we gathered, what, what um, phenomenal thing we're going to put forward as our next steps. But it's really important that, and this is really important to, to the Dean and, and to Gareth and to the process, is that the process continues to evolve. We do not have set ideas. Bringing these experts here today, uh, whether it's, it's Stan with, with drums and, 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 and guitars trying to um, um, you know, make everybody else look drab and boring, or, <laughs> or whether it's Michael accepting self-blame for all sorts of things, or, or Erez Monka, as, I mean, you know, his, his, his tour, who couldn't be inspired? Uh, by those Cat Island names and, and, and think deeply about, you know, what he has lived through and what, what, the, what the opportunities are. So this is a real exercise and I don't want anyone believing that, that Harvard really is intent on writing this prescription for us. Harvard is intent on continuing to facilitate the process. So next, we're going to have, there are going to be several other initiatives that take place. There's going to be executive leadership uh, training. There's going to be career discovery opportunities at Harvard. There are scholarships for, for Bahamians uh, included in this program. Um, those will not be political appointees, so do not run to your MP. Those will be, you have to, we will have to apply and pass Harvard's very rigid application process. So this, don't run the MP for that. And also, 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 we're going to have some of our friends from Harvard going into communities uh, over, the, over the coming months and sitting, talking, listening, uh, trying to understand more about this process, trying to pull out of you. Because, you know, Bahamians, we don't like to, often don't like to talk in, because, you know, I'm typically shy, like most of us. We don't like to talk. <laughs> in large forums, but often in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and that's what the process will be over the next couple of months, and that is going to inform where this process goes. So I really would like to thank all of you, the DPM in his absence, uh, the Dean, uh, Mr. President, Neil, uh, all of you who have sat, who've contributed, and I hope that all of you will be inspired to think more about it. The Facebook page is going to continue to remain active as an opportunity to present your thoughts. Those of you that didn't, uh, uh, wasn't, weren't able to crystallize your questions, send them to, to, to us uh, via the Facebook page and we'll make sure that they get attended to. Uh, thank you all so very much. This is really, for me, you know, and we've been, Eleanor, my partner in crime, not crime, we're not criminals, but <laughs> Eleanor and I, uh, as you know, have, have have run a parallel course through the public service and in the environmental arena in the NGO sector. Uh, and we have always been looking to make sure that opportunities like this present themselves for Bahamians to get involved in the process that gives us, gives us good guidance for what happens to our country, you know, 200 years from now. So thank you all very much. I'd like to remind you all that a very important conference is taking place. This is my brainchild, so you all have to be here. Uh, we have a Bahamas, the first Bahamas National Natural History Conference, which is taking place here at the College of the Bahamas uh, from the 5th to the 8th of March, so in a couple of weeks. We have been had phenomenal responses, over 100 abstracts. Uh, we're going to have a roundtable in landscape ecology that Gareth has promised me he's coming back for. So I don't know if you've asked the dean for permission, but I've put it out there. Um, and all of you, <laughs> all of you should come because it's going to be an incredible, you know, uh, I'd love to have people like, you know, Dwayne Curtis, uh, who's been uh, one of our lead scientists in the country to come and listen to these and give these people advice and guidance about the type of research that we want. So March 5th through 8th, 
It's going to be, we have, we're going to have parallel sessions because we have so many. Some are going to be held here. Some are going to be held at the, uh, the Performing Arts Center. And we also, in addition to those uh, 100 abstracts, I think about 80 talks and about 15 posters, <laughs> that's up to 100, and about uh, seven or eight incredible films. So please come back. So right now, we have a reception over at Choices Restaurant. And um, you're all welcome to come and join us. Oh, oh, sorry. We would like to actually, yeah, Rochelle, come. Stand up here. Come. Come, come. Come, come. So, so Rochelle Nubol is, is, you know, and this is important, that the process is being driven by, by, by Rochelle. Rochelle is, is a very qualified, competent, dedicated Bayman, <laughs> and she has been, I'm not going to repeat this ever again. <laughs> uh, but she, and this, is, this was important to everybody involved in this process, that, you know, the donors, uh, the dean, everybody, that this be led by, by Bahamians and facilitated by Harvard. And Rochelle Newbold, all of you will get to know very well because she's going to be involved in this process for the next couple of years. And she wants me to tell you to please leave your name tags because we are recycling them for future events. Thank you. Let's go to the reception.